You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome to Music Tectonics, the podcast that goes beneath the surface of music and... Wait, wait, what, did, you, did you hear that? I, what was that? Yeah, it was pretty... I, I mean... I'm glad I'm I'm glad I'm not I'm glad I'm not hallucinating but you know this time of year I have to tell you I can't help but feel a little on edge with all the you know spirits walking the earth and stuff like that so you know just between us I'm curious maybe the podcast studio is a little haunted or is the entire music business haunted Okay, okay, you guessed it. This is our annual Halloween episode, and I am your ridiculously spooky host, Tristra New Year Jaeger, recovering goth, and also chief strategy officer at Rock, Paper, Scissors, the music innovation PR firm. Today, I'm joined by journalist and music business thinker Eamon Ford, who has thought a lot about dead artists and their continued impact on the industry. Eamon's name should be familiar to most of you, especially if you read The Guardian, Music Business Worldwide, IQ, and Music Alley, which you should be reading, among many other outlets. He's also the author of an in-depth history of music estates called Leaving the Building, The Lucrative Afterlife of Music Estates. And it's an incredibly encyclopedic and thorough work. It's really impressive. So, hey, Eamon, thanks for joining me today. Hello. Uh, very nice to be here. <laughs> so um, first, I think before we go any further and before I make any more ridiculous puns about the holidays, I would love to just talk to you for a second about some really basic stuff. So we talk about artist estates. Everyone kind of has like a vague idea of what that means. But what actually is included in an artist estate? What do we really mean legally when we say that? What's usually involved in, in figuring things out after an artist passes away? Right. Well, there are lots of different moving parts, which is why when you see posthumous rich lists, why artists tend to dominate every year, Forbes does its uh, um, list of richest dead uh, celebrities, and it tends to be dominated by musicians because there are lots of different parts. So you've got recorded music rights, you've got publishing, you've got me and me to likeness, you've got brands all of these different things. So not all artists cover all of these areas, but most of them do. So they're they're making money, or that sorry, their estates are making money in a variety of ways uh, compared to, for example, you would see in the uh, Forbes Rich List, you would see Charles Schultz, which is obviously uh, that state makes most of its money, like Snoopy or mm -hmm. Arnold Palmer from Golf Products, things like that. But when you're looking at a mega earning dead uh, musician, there are lots and lots of different ways that they make money. They also could have uh, interest outside of music, obviously things like property or investment in other companies and things like that. So generally you're talking about a business with a lot of different component parts, uh, most of which can generate significant sums of money and collectively can generate phenomenal sums of money. Are all of these different rights stipulated in a will or are they just sort of included, you know, when someone's alive, when they sign a contract, does that automatically kind of translate if they pass away into these, you know, estate rights? Am I, I don't know if I'm even asking the question correctly, but you know what I mean is do, do artists have to have a will for all this to be in place or are there other means to uh, sort of decide this? It's like anyone uh, with a will. So there are, it obviously depends what country or uh, mm -hmm. in the US, what state you're in about what the uh, what the right the, the passage of ownership is dependent so, uh, automatically would default to a spouse or to children or to near family and then if uh, no near family can be tracked down uh, it can go to extended family so there are various different stages someone dies without a will about who gets it and then eventually if they can't track down anyone and it goes beyond extended family then I believe the government will take it but that's incredibly rare that that would happen there's always some family members somewhere and that's obviously if you don't leave a will or but specifically if, you, if it's a big estate if you don't leave a trust which is mm -hmm. much more about the control of those assets a will will generally decide who gets the assets who gets the money who gets the rights uh, whereas a trust will uh, 
uh, qualify a bit further on what they can uh, and cannot allow uh, to happen with their uh, with their rights or with their name, image, and likeness, and things like that. So, uh, and like in the non-celebrity world, you will be horrified and surprised to learn that lots and lots of artists don't leave wills, that wow. they don't leave updated wills, mm-hmm. um, they leave multiple conflicting wills, and they can leave a terrible, terrible mass behind for the heirs. Yeah, uh, considering how much money is at stake, it's surprising how many uh, musicians die without leaving proper wills or watertight wills uh, that end up being dragged through the courts or go through probate, and it's just a terrible mass and everything kind of gets pushed to the side or put on hold until this is sort of out and they kind of lose momentum around the estate as well because no one can do anything and there are i'm sure we can get into it there are many many huge high profile examples of artists who had no estate planning or very bad estate planning yeah how and how are say labels or publishers involved in a, in these scenarios where there isn't a clear will and where things have to go through probate what's you know wh- how do they do they get involved you know legally or do they sort of wait until those things get sorted out in your just you know in general for the most part they tend to stay out of things Obviously, uh, they, if you're a label, particularly in the streaming area, you can continue to make money uh, mm-hmm. from that. Obviously, if there are royalties due, they may have to put that into a hold of the kind until it's mm-hmm. decided who gets that money and things like that. So that they generally tend to, to stay out of things, although I, I even though he wasn't uh, directly, I, I guess he was directly involved, but... Um, in the long drawn out Bob Marley estate, which mm-hmm. kind of it was a, a dragged on for years by who on what and things like that, uh, Chris Blackwell, the founder of Ireland, got involved. But I guess he also had a shared interest because he had a partial share of Bob Marley's publishing, so he was kind mm-hmm. of he had a cut of the publishing, so he had a vaster interest in that. And uh, you will see things like Universal, for example, after Amy Winehouse died, they put out one album, Lioness, which had uh, outtakes and, and uh, demos and things like that. And then they claimed, whether or not they did, is up to debate, they claimed that they deleted everything else to stop the kind of vaults being read it. So you had an example of a label taking a very proactive approach saying, okay, that's it. That's everything that's ever going to be released under Amy Winehouse's name. There's going to be no new uh, material. There's going to be no kind of AI duets or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So but those are very, very extreme examples. So most of the time, the label will kind of step back and let the heirs sort it out. You may have someone who's brought in, as in the case of the Prince estate, uh, you had uh, a bank was basically brought in to kind of run things until all the heirs resolved uh, kind of what shares they were getting. So, uh, and they brought in some outside experts to help with the archives. And um, so product, coming into the market they, it just didn't stop they had people like troy carter was involved for a while they had quince's old uh, catalog manager from warners got involved so things there didn't stop just because just because the ownership of the estate wasn't completely nailed down and uh, wasn't completely legally defined it doesn't necessarily mean that the market around that estate has to stop Although in some other cases, for example, the James Brown estate, because mm-hmm. it was so ugly and dragged through the courts for so long, pretty much everything was on hold just because they couldn't figure out who owned what. And there was uh, injunctions and lawsuits flying left, right and centre. And it, it was just an absolute mess that took like 10, 13 years to, to finally get resolved. This is very, very interesting. I see why you got intrigued by artist estates, but I would really love to hear how you started going down this this very large and complicated rabbit hole. Um, what drew you to documenting estates and taking a look at, I mean, they're almost like little weird portraits of 
the music business writ large, but I want to hear how you got into this. This is pretty interesting. Yeah, well, I guess the, the most obvious uh, reason to get interested in it was general nosiness. There wasn't much <laughs> written about uh, music affairs. And, and what was written tended to be quite scandalous. Mm. Like music, music affairs tended to be covered when everything went wrong. So uh, when if someone died and they hadn't left a will or heirs were fighting amongst mm-hmm. themselves, and it was always always the negative side of estates that were being written about. And I wanted to understand that as, yeah, that's absolutely part of it because that is a consequence of not leaving a will or fight over ownership and fight over rights are nothing new in the music industry. It just becomes much more complicated when the uh, the creator of those rights or part creator of those rights is no longer alive to, mm-hmm. to join in the debate. Uh so I, I wanted to figure out what this business was, what it involved. It's a thing, it's an area that doesn't really publicly blow its own trumpet that much, mm-hmm. which I guess made it much more interesting. Me. I didn't think that they were being duplicitous or that they were trying to hide something. It was just maybe partly the reason that people feel a little bit uneasy, that there's a, a very clear business behind this, that... Mm-hmm. Uh, People are acting on behalf of a, of a dead artist and so forth. But I obviously, I've been following, I think since, I think it was 2000, 2001, Forbes started doing its uh, posthumous uh, rich list. So it was always, mm-hmm. I saw that every year. I was always intrigued by the names that were crop up. And it was also interesting seeing what names fell in and out of the top 13, as they used to list it. And I freelanced for The Guardian, and I was asked to write a piece about the posthumous rich list and kind of who are the winners, uh, the, the writers, and, uh, and so forth in that uh, rich list. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but it's basically just uh, regurgitating what Ford said. And I said, I'd be much more interested in speaking to the people who run these estates. Mm-hmm. So I got commissioned to do a a bigger piece, which is basically use the Forbes numbers as jumping off point and actually go and speak to uh, people who ran estates. So I, I spoke to a few people I knew, uh, record companies, as a, kind of a starting point to see how they dealt with uh, the marketing of uh, that artist. Mm-hmm. And then through someone who will remain nameless, I got uh, an email uh, contact for John Branca, who is a uh, co-executor of the Michael Jackson estate. And I just cold emailed him and said, I'm writing this piece for The Guardian. Can I speak to you? And incredibly, he got back to me and went, yeah, I'll speak to you. Wow. So... Uh, and this is obviously the most lucrative and in also probably the most controversial uh, mm-hmm. music estate out there. And then I also, because I was just interested in this person as an artist and also just the fact that they became posthumously more famous, I spoke to uh, Callie Callaman, who runs the estate for Nick Drake, the English singer-songwriter. Oh, yeah, who, yeah, yeah. He only, he only did three albums in his lifetime. They didn't really sell much, but uh, kind of over the years, his legend had grown. So that went into a piece in The Guardian. And obviously, I had the kind of the two extremes of estates in that sense, where I had the person who runs the Michael Jackson estate, the blockbuster music estate. And then I had the person who runs uh, the Nick Drake estate, uh, a very, very small estate, but some one that has been kind of steadily building uh, and kind of keeping the, the, making the artist more famous in death than they were in life. So I thought between those two extremes, I wanted to kind of fill in the gaps. So I uh, was pitching different big ideas to Omnibus. I'd already done a, uh, actually, it was the first, that was the first thing I pitched to them. I, they, they, they'd asked me to pick some ideas. Mm-hmm. And I was working on, on the estates piece at the time. But then I'd also written a piece about uh, years before for another magazine called Word about uh, uh, Terra Firma's uh, very short-lived and somewhat disastrous uh, acquisition of EMI, which they bought in 2007 for 
just over four billion pounds. Uh, they lost control of it within about three and a half years, mm-hmm. and then they got carved up. So uh, they, Omnibus, in their wisdom, I think they were right to do so, uh, uh, do the EMI book. And then when I when I did that, I pitched the second book. I said it has to be states. I'm not even pitching another idea. And they went, okay, do states. And the timing was good because. By that point, the gap in between things like um, hologram tours had become mm-hmm. much more prevalent. By this stage, you had things like Maria Callas, uh, Whitney Houston, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Buddy Holly, Roy Orbison. Uh, and these were, were being put on the road. These were touring hologram shows. Well, they're not holograms in, in the true sense. It's just mm-hmm. an optical illusion from... Victorian times called Pepper's Ghost, which is basically reflects an image onto a transparent surface, so it appears like they're they're on stage. Amazing. So uh, things like that had kind of come along. So I think that was a really interesting kind of meeting point of technology and rights and the future. And then obviously now we've got things like, and it's much more pronounced uh, AI and mm-hmm. what it can do. Yeah. So. The, the, the timing was right because it's something it wasn't just going well the stopping point is streaming and youtube and that kind of it then suddenly you had this whole new thing a thing that wasn't previously possible which was uh putting the dad artists back on the roads whether uh, like uh moral ethical uh quibbles aside is fascinating as a piece of business as a market and exercise all of those things so i think it was the timing was good to do that book second, so because there was more to write about. Mm-hmm. Music estates. I think technology had impacted it in a wholly unexpected way, and some estates had chosen to run with that. Yeah, I think we should talk about that at length in just a second here. But first, in your book, you have a super interesting sort of almost like a starting point for the modern music estate and how it was defined. And you cite Elvis and his estate and the way it was managed as kind of like setting the tone for a lot of other future blockbuster estates. And I'm sure there's a lot of resonance with Michael Jackson's estate, for example. So I'm really curious if you could tell us a bit about that history and what's still relevant or defining um, in the decisions that were made by Elvis's uh, manager after he passed. You know, what's still relevant to today's artists and how or today's recently deceased artists, I guess, um, and how how is that still uh, impacting the way people approach their estates today? Yeah, well, the, the book is called "Leaving the Building" for a very, very clear reason. Because <laughs> yes, and the, and the title didn't come to me until about I've pretty much written about three quarters of the book. So I've done all the interviews. I was piecing it all together. And just in every chapter, there was always a thread or a very, very clear, solid uh, rope going back to the Elvis estate. It wasn't Mm. the first estate. It wasn't the first one to, because we obviously had things like uh, uh, Robert Johnson had been kind of rediscovered in the late Mm -hmm. 50s, early 60s. You had... Otis Rabbing, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, was the first posthumous number one, which was mm. a song which wasn't quite finished before he died, but was kind of completed and then quickly uh, rushed out. Uh, you obviously had things like Buddy Holly had a, a degree of uh, posthumous success, and none of it was was new, but nothing had happened on the scale of what uh, happened with Elvis, because it's at the point where it became industrialized, I think, where it became a huge machine that went beyond just a here's a single or here's an anniversary or here's a, a, a new compilation album. It was much more encompassing than any of the other states. And obviously, Elvis was a huge, huge name as well. Mm-hmm. So you obviously you're you're dealing with a with a superstar who died relatively young, and uh, was uh, an icon of almost religious proportions by by the time he died, and he really only had what a twenty two year career. It was in in relative terms, it was a pretty short lived thing, and it's important to remember at that time as well that 
lots of artists, the, this nostalgia part of the business, this archive part of the business didn't really exist there. But it was like the, you you ran interviews with from, uh, with people like Paul McCartney or Mick Jagger in the mid-60s, and they're all going, we think we've probably got another couple of years left. And that's it. This idea of just kind of mm-hmm. going back to history didn't exist. So the Elvis estate was kind of born out of necessity because Elvis... Uh, Elvis was an incredible performer. Elvis was a far from incredible businessman. Elvis made incredibly, incredibly stupid business decisions all through his career. Uh, He gave over half of his earnings to Tom Parker. There's a great quote from Tom Parker, which someone said, uh, because normally in the UK, a manager takes 20%. I think Mm -hmm. in the US, it's 15%. 15% tends mm-hmm. to be the yep. going rate. Uh, Tom Parker was taking at least 50%. He also had set up a company called Boxcar for Elvis's merchandise, of which he was also kind of funneling some money from that. So uh, Elvis uh, was badly in that. Also, he had an uh, incredible approach to the IRS in that lots of artists tend to run away from the IRS and pay yes. as little as possible. Elvis felt that it was his patriotic duty to pay more tax than he was actually uh, due. He also was a uh, an incredible spender of money as mm-hmm. well. He lived an extravagant lifestyle. So Elvis was had drastically living beyond his means. Uh, so when he died, basically, the estate was circling the plug hole of insolvency. Everything was going terribly, terribly wrong for them. So they had to make decisions very, very quickly. And you also had things like Tom Parker had done astonishingly bad deals for him. He'd sold all of his recorded music rights back to RCA. I think it's everything up until about 1972 for a pittance, of which he obviously took 50% or more. And there's a line, someone said, uh, uh, how do you feel uh, having taken 50% of everything Elvis uh, ever earned and he said no 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 you got it wrong Elvis took 50% of everything I ever earned so wow. you had you, know, you had a very ruthless uh, business manager in the shape of Tom Parker and you had a very pliable mm-hmm. and not smart artist in, in the shape of Elvis who was given away too much of his money on bad deals and also and then what was left was just being burned through at a, at a ferocious rate which is in part why he was kind of seeing out his final days in vegas because he was just he just needed to be out there earning money um, mm-hmm. so the estate basic they looked at the at the finances were just gone this whole thing is going to collapse so they had to very quickly uh, rush product into the market. Uh, they also had to make that very, very emotional decision to go, well, we need to make money quickly. And their decision was to open up Graceland as a tourist attraction. And this was, uh, they could only, in the early days, they only opened up part of Graceland. It's not what it is now, where it's like mm-hmm. you can walk around and see everything. On the first floor, uh, one of Elvis's aunts and her dog was still living there while the other visitors were kind of tramping along, looking at uh, the rooms where Elvis used to, used to live. Um, they had an enormous, enormous tax bill because like, uh, lots of estates get stung by this where they have inheritance yeah. tax and things like that. So they very quickly needed to raise money. So the only way they could do that was to... Uh, uh, open up Graceland, and it was going to take a while to uh, to fix Graceland to turn it into a tourist attraction. So they sold tickets in advance, and those tickets in advance were basically there to pay the tax bill. And from that, there was uh, a judge was looking into the the business dealings and uh, basically found that Tom Parker was a had far too much influence and was taking far too much money and eventually he was caught out. He basically forced uh, Elvis's funeral. He basically forced Vernon, Elvis's dad, to to uh, extend his management contract on the day of the funeral, which is uh, uh, a, uh, a business strategy. It's an interesting one. As, yeah, a, as, a, form, as, as a form of emotional leverage, it's a, it's a morally questionable one. 
And Elvis, if, if Elvis wasn't a good business uh, person, his father was infinitely worse. So <laughs> they, he basically signed a, everything over to keep um, Tom Parker going. So there's that quote about uh, uh, Elvis didn't die, the body did, it's business as usual. And uh, mm-hmm. and then there was another line, he said, like, hey, someone said that they saw tears in my eyes at Elvis's funeral. They were wrong. It was just someone was squeezing my wallet in my pocket and things like that. So it was like oh lots God. of great lines from Tom Parker. And you would want him as a raconteur at a dinner party. You wouldn't want him running your business because he would take absolutely everything from you. So uh, eventually what happened was that Priscilla uh, kind of took over the running. And I think if there's any one individual who can be defined as the architect of the modern estate. It's without doubt Priscilla Presley because she took what was a moribund business operation and turned it into something phenomenal. She repositioned that. This is obviously someone who was separated from Elvis because Mm -hmm. Elvis was... How do I put this politely? Elvis was a very tactile gentleman and it it wasn't necessarily just confined to Priscilla. So there was all of that going on in her head. So, but she also was acting on behalf of Lisa Marie. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Lisa Marie was uh, had was the sole beneficiary of as well. She got Graceland, uh, all the money that was due through merchandise and things like that. So Priscilla had to step in and just go. Well, my daughter's entire. Uh, legacy and and ingham is at risk here so she completely brought in a team of very insightful driven people and she basically turned elvis into this posthumous brand on a scale that had never been seen before and that's kind of that kind of carry through she's still effectively a spokesperson although there was obviously huge kind of fallout from uh, after Lisa Marie died and mm-hmm. he took over her estate and the kind of the role that Priscilla would play. But basically all through, if you basically from the early 80s, really, late 70s, very early 80s, when Priscilla took over, and what she did with the Elvis estate was phenomenal. She turned it into this financial juggernaut. And for many, many years, up until, uh, uh, I guess, just uh, until Michael Jackson died, Elvis had the most lucrative, uh, music estate uh, up until that point. So she's done yeah. an incredible job of, of keeping him in the public consciousness. I say in the book that an estate only has two jobs. It's got to bring in money and it's got to keep the artist relevant. And by any measurement, uh, Priscilla Presley did a phenomenal job on both counts. So all yeah. the things that she did are and in some ways, she would have made mistakes. She maybe did some really bad deals that uh, or either didn't pay off or uh, didn't get a sufficient enough cut. But uh, she she kept the Elvis name alive and she kept the Elvis business alive. I'm, so everyone could, that, yeah. everything, everything that kind of comes in her way is basically uh, following her template or trying to perfect her template. I... I I, um, this was it just became apparent all the way through the book. We just gone, but the Elvis estate did that, and this is just directly followed on from the Elvis estate. So it's the blueprint. So that's why, well, obviously there was a a, a lovely pan in uh, leaving the building, uh, <laughs> but I I had to make I didn't want to make it a book about Elvis, but I could not uh, say explain just how important how significant the Elvis estate is obviously it's been overtaken by other estates that make more money but none of them could have done what they did without Elvis because it it kind of it changed the public's perception of how that artist can be marketed Mm -hmm. as well so everyone else is even if they don't think they're following the template that uh Priscilla created, they're certainly benefiting from the shift in culture that she facilitated. So I want to ask you really fast, Eamon, I mean, obviously, I think Elvis is alone in having a mysterious cult where people believe he's still alive, right? And I, that sort of died down a yes. little bit. But when I was younger, that was actually still kind of a thing. Um, and yeah. it was always sort of half in jest. And then, you know, very few artists make their um, homes into shrines for tourists to visit. But what did Priscilla do exactly, I mean, in, in very, um, you know, general terms that 
was the template? Was it, you know, was it the way she managed his recordings or was it more of this quote unquote, you know, branding um, that I, I, allowed I, her to think, be so successful? Yeah, it was more with the branding side of things because uh, the recorded side of Elvis' estate is, is a fraction mm-hmm. of its total income because as I said, like up until 71, 72, all the recorded rights had been bought out by RCA, which is obviously now part of Sony. So they don't make money out of a mm-hmm. lot of, of those recorded rights. Obviously, Elvis didn't write music, but Tom Parker was a very canny man where he cut Elvis in, and mm-hmm. himself, obviously, in on, <laughs> uh, on a share of the publishing. So they would obviously go to songwriters and go, do you want Elvis to uh, sing your song? Um, uh, you have to give up X percent of the royalty. So they would go, do we want 100% of nothing or do we, we want 75% of a huge amount of money? We'll take the 75% please. <laughs> Very so rational decision, how, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I, I, I don't know if it's a 25% split, but I know that they, they certainly did some uh, uh, behind closed doors dealing. So you had mm-hmm. that, but really it, was Graceland, which uh, it loves to proclaim is the second most visited house in America after the White House. Mm-hmm. It's a huge, huge tourist. I mean, you look at the, you go in there and you're like, if you want to get the full experience, it's, it's a couple of hundred dollars just to, to go and see all of the different parts of the estate. They also, and I think the true genius thing they did in the 80s was that uh after he died, uh, obviously people would flock to Graceland. They turned Graceland into this tourist destination. But in the streets around it, just like these kind of quite tiny souvenir shops would spring up selling Elvis uh, merchandise, unofficial Elvis merchandise or uh, whatever. And there, there was very little that they could do. So very quietly, uh, the Elvis estate slowly bought up all of the real estate they got. They obviously didn't want people to know that it was mm-hmm. uh, the Elvis estate because then they would be charged through the nose. So they basically bought up most of the property around the estate and were able to drive out all of the uh, the terrible tabby souvenir shops. So they took over everything. So it was a long term investment about how do we how do we actually physically control the uh, emotional real estate around Elvis and the physical real estate around Graceland. So they did things like that. And then obviously there were, you had things like in the 90s, you had a reissue of lots of singles. You had that mm-hmm. Junkie XL, a little less conversation remix, which was like a, I don't know, it was a big number one in the UK. I can't remember what it did in the US. And then that goes all the way up to the, the Baz Luhrmann film from. Yeah what two three years ago yeah exactly Um, because they they just kept working it they were never really quiet there was always stuff happening around Hmm. the elvis estate so there was merchandise there was always re-releases of stuff and obviously there was the elvis movies as well although they are not exactly great art statements but (laughs) they're they're another they're another thing that people like them yeah well they're well, yeah, but people like a lot of things. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, Elvis didn't even like Elvis's films, and Elvis was in them. Uh, so there was all of those things, and yes. I, I think mer- merchandise was a was a huge, huge part of it. So like, That's if you so look at all important. the official. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and, and they probably they got a much they probably uh, make a lot more money out of merchandise than uh, recorded music and then obviously you can build up a very successful business if you do not have this profligate person still alive spending money like it's going out of fashion so suddenly you turn off the spam tap i.e elvis and mm-hmm. then you increase the 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 flow of money into the banks. It's a it's a good business. It's like it's a it's it's, it's that old cliche you always hear about uh, record executives always say that the, the record industry would be great if it wasn't for artists. The estates are what happens when you take that artist out of the equation or take their agency out of the equation. You can make a lot of money. They're a lot less demanding, and they do what they what they're told to do, which is probably the ruthless. Uh, record executives dream client 
<laughs> well, we're going to take a quick break um, on that and we'll come back to where estates are today and the impact they're having on the business right now. The news cycle of the music industry and innovation in particular is accelerating at such a fast pace, it can be hard to keep up. That's why I launched Rock Paper Scanner, a free newsletter you can get in your inbox every Friday morning. Check out bit.ly slash RP scanner. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash RP scanner. I scan hundreds of outlets for you from the music trades to the tech blogs, from the music gear mags to lifestyle outlets so that you don't have to. I handpick everything music tech, including industry revenue numbers, AI, cool new user tools, the live music and recording landscapes, partnerships and acquisitions, and everything else a Music Tectonics podcast listener would want to know. Open a browser right now and punch in bit.ly slash RP scanner to sign up right now. Go ahead, hit pause and go to bit.ly slash RP scanner or find the episode's blog post on musictectonics.com and find that link. Happy scanning, but for now, happy listening. Okay, we're back with Eamon Ford to talk about how technology and the current financialization of music is impacting the way estates operate and what they mean for the business. So uh, before we get there, though, I'm going to throw in a little bit of a curveball Um Eamon, and I'm sorry to do this, but I was just thinking about Marvin Gaye's estate and how they have had a huge impact on, in some ways, on the creative side of music in that they've they've mounted some legal challenges to some pretty big hits on some interesting new grounds that, you know, did set some some precedents for the business that are quite um, uh, quite astounding. Right. So the Blurred Lines case yeah. comes to mind. I'm curious um, what your thoughts were as you were working through all this material and thinking about estates in such depth. You know, how have they, how do dead artists and those who represent them impact the way living artists make music? That's a really interesting question. And as you say, Marvin Gaye uh, is the, the kind of the pertinent example. I think that was mm-hmm. more driven by uh, his heirs rather than the estate the estate per se got it but you had you had lots of people who would have been contemporaries of marvin gay going please don't pursue this lawsuit or the 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 ruling is really really bad they all felt that marvin gay would have uh been against it because in the blurred lines case it was more about the mood and the feel. I think there was a kind of smoke and gun quote from an interview with Pharrell where he said, oh, we wanted to go for this. They call you the Marvin Gaye feel, that kind of party in the studio feel. And that very much went against them. And I think, and certainly if you look at the way that Motown worked, and mm-hmm. obviously Marvin Gaye kind of having kind of come up as a session musician and a writer and then a performer in his own right, the way that Motown worked and the way that it referenced, let's, let's use that in inverted commas, other music, mm-hmm. sometimes the, a previous hit. Uh, Motown was an incredibly self-referential machine itself. And Marvin Gaye had gone through that machine and he understood that uh, musical ideas spring clearly from other musical creations and um, obviously you don't want to rip something off completely but you can't deny that everything you've ever listened to shapes your creativity yeah and i think and i think the the blurred lines case was a really extreme example of that being pursued to the latter in a legal way that i think is inherently awful for for creativity. It's basically saying anything that sounds vaguely like it could have been by another artist. So uh, outside of the laws of parody and pastiche, uh, it suddenly becomes fair game. So then you've got you've got a lot of artists and a lot of songwriters becoming incredibly nervous about the songs that they write, and I think that leads to a much blander songwriting process. Mm-hmm. If you have a really good idea, you're paranoid that it's come from something else. I'm always reminded of that um, story of uh, Paul McCartney writing yesterday. So it like it arrived, the melody arrived fully formed in his head, and like he obviously uh, he hadn't worked out the lyrics, but he had the melody firmly in his head, and he was going around playing it to people, going, "Yeah, it's nice, this, isn't it?" Uh, but 
who, where's it from? Where's it from? Someone, someone, he couldn't believe that this song had a wry, fully formed in his head and eventually he became convinced that, no, this is completely original. Mm-hmm. You wrote that or you wrote it in your dreams or whatever. Uh, but in in the modern age, if Paul McCartney would go, that's too perfect. I can't, and then that song would have been scrapped. Some people might say, yesterday's been overplayed and that's probably for the best if it had been scrapped but it's that <laughs> idea that artists uh i'm very very pro paul mccartney by the way so paul <laughs> okay. wrong in my book. I, I, I don't want to see that as a, as a slur on maca he is he's the greatest of all of us but <laughs> uh it, it's that kind of thing where suddenly that inspiration and i think that it goes back to an idea i've always had about art which is art great art should surprise the creator just as much as it uh, surprises the audience. It's, it's almost like you're this conduit. Yeah. Like you're pulling it out of the sky and it's somehow, it's it's beyond human in a way. It's like to me, you just go, my God, where did that come from? Like mm-hmm. you might have like, I'm not going to compare myself to Paul McCartney, but like <laughs> sometimes you might write, you might write a sentence or a headline or something like yeah. that. And you go, my God, that's brilliant. Like it's very rare that it happens, but it, it but it feels like yeah. something. It's obviously coming from deep from your subconscious, but you can't figure out how it got there. You don't understand the journey that it got there. And at a very at a much 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 more elevated level, are musicians, and sometimes that does come from songs that they've heard before, and they subconsciously or unintentionally uh, kind of grab a melody from somewhere, and uh, maybe they and. Um, for the most part, uh, most of these artists don't mean to. It's just there's there's only there's only so many chords and so many notes out there. So uh, you're you're working with a limited combination, an incredibly yeah. limited combination. So there will be some degree of crossover or overlapping songs. But I think once you start going down the blurred lines route, I think what you're what you're doing is you're layering on a paranoia to creativity. Um, and that, if anything's going to kill creativity, it's paranoia. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Now, I'm sorry to do this. We're taking things from the kind of celestial realm down to the nitty gritty, earthy realm of money. But, yeah. you know, with there's been a big shift in the industry about um, basically monetizing music as an IP right, right? As an IP, as, as intellectual property, right? So music rights have become yeah. much more, um, you know, much more liquid in a way, um, easier to sell easier to buy you can they can be chopped up they can you know there's funds that are doing this um and i'm curious how you're seeing this if 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 you've noticed any change in the way estates are approaching um approaching uh, catalog because it's you know it, it must have been a more difficult feat 20 years ago to be like hey i need to sell my rights or maybe it wasn't I, i'm just curious what your what your feeling is from all your research well, 20 years ago, music rights were uh, just to go about to go down the toilet. You had yeah, to that's true. Comply. That's true. I picked a bad. You I picked a bad the, era. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, 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 the decline in record sales was kind yeah. of starting to bite in the, mm. the post Napster slump. Yeah, and music was seen as a just as a, a, a pointless, risky investment. Mm-hmm. Uh, music assets were really, really devalued until. And I know lots of artists and songwriters have their arguments against streaming, but it was streaming that completely revitalized the fortunes. And Absolutely. I think streaming and social media have given estates much more control than they ever had because historically, outside of a bit of merchandise, and you had to be a superstar to really sell merchandise, mm-hmm. it was... Everything was being driven by the record company. It was the recorded rights were paramount. Mm-hmm. So it was the record label that said, we're going to put out this anniversary album or we're going to put out another greatest hits or whatever. And the estates just kind of had to nod and go along and obviously take the checks as well. Uh, but I think in the... And obviously then they would have to pay for physical products. You would have mm-hmm. to... You would be limited in in what you put out because there was production costs, lead time, things like that. Streaming, like I I, I give the example in the book of um, a major artist who died, and uh, someone at their record company, I'm not say who it was, uh, 
said, we want to press up X million CDs and basically overrode what their bosses said because they knew that this would be a massive seller. But it was still, it was a, that was a huge gamble because they still had a couple of weeks. They basically told a, their CD pressing plant to stop everything and just focus on this artist's greatest hits and a couple of their biggest albums and just flood the shops with them and... They, they, it was a phenomenal uh, kind of sales boom for them. But there's always there's always that lag. You're talking mm-hmm. things like there's a few weeks between someone dying to get product into record shop. It's instant now. All you need to do it takes you. It'll take someone five minutes to do a this is a insert name of dead pop star here greatest hits. Mm-hmm. And uh, but that's also that immediacy of streaming, but also social social media has put the estate themselves in a much stronger position where they can do things uh, that previously they had to rely on record companies to do. So I think you're starting to see uh, estates become more autonomous, less dependent on record labels than they were, simply because there's so much more that they can do themselves. If you run the official... Instagram and Twitter and maybe even threads, who knows, or TikTok account for an artist. This is all stuff being run outside, in most cases, outside of the control and uh, of the record labels, and you're mm-hmm. not running to their agenda. And also, record companies are, uh, particularly the major labels, have huge catalogs, and they don't want to be doing intricate reissued campaigns for every single artist on their books and the things like that and they'll just go anniversaries are easy it's a marketing thing but i think what's happened now with social media and with streaming is that estates and this is fundamental to estates estates have to as i say make money and keep the artist relevant mm-hmm. they can treat the dad artist as if they're a frontline artist now they there, there could be a steady flow of content so social media posts things like that that go out uh all the time so it's that idea of you are constantly reminding people of the presence it's not just every 10 years here's another greatest hit or it's 40 years since this artist died by their single again or something like that because that was very calendar driven and i think in the social media age and the streaming media age you have to be omnipresent you can't disappear for 10 years and then go hey remember me because a whole generation will have grown up and forgotten about you yeah but also that's where younger potential fans are they're not going to go and buy a uh $200 uh immersive box set reissue of some classic album they don't care about that they go are the songs good and do they look cool and do i want to listen to them are they on spotify are they on apple music are they on tiktok are they on youtube that's fine that's all you want and then suddenly that gives the estate incredible autonomy and a whole multitude of kind of marketing channels and ways to engage audiences that they never had before. They it was a very slow paced thing estates until really you could maybe see it with the arrival of the iTunes music store in mm-hmm. two thousand and three, the kind of the mainstreaming of paid downloads. And then by the time Spotify comes along later in the decade, I think it was I think it was two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten, was it in the US? It was about two thousand and seven. Yeah, that sounds about right. Europe. Yeah. It was a couple of years behind in the mm-hmm. US. But by let's say let's say twenty twelve, you had a multitude of you had steady growth of streaming and you had a multitude of social media channels out there. And I think by that point uh, estates were suddenly a lot more powerful and could be a lot more proactive. They didn't, they don't have to run on the labels kind of marketing calendar. And also, not everything's about the recorded part of an artist's legacy or an artist's career. That's the bit that the record companies are interested in, of course. Mm-hmm. But there's everything else, namely yeah. some like Mr. White's brand and all of these other things that the labels may not have the rights to. So why would why would they care? Why would they drive things like that? They're not good. They drove, they put the record as central because that was the bit where they made the money because they owned the rights. 
but uh, an estate is uh, the the records are only part of it. Um, now the estates can handle a lot of that themselves. That's really really important, and I think it's really important to the future of estates and dead artists. And we'll get to that in just a second after the break. What's up, beautiful listeners? Now I have a question for you. What do you want to hear next? Let me know at musictectonics.com slash podcast. Click the big pink button to fill out a quick survey. Suggest future guests or music innovation topics you want to hear Dimitri and Tristra cover. Or just tell me how we're doing. That's at musictectonics.com slash podcast. Now back to the show. We're back here with Ewan Ford talking about the future of dead artists. Sorry to put it so bluntly, but um, this is a really interesting moment for likenesses and rights of publicity and all of those exciting things because of the advent of, you know, mass available generative AI. So I'm really curious about, you know, what you're thinking, Ewan, regarding Things like voice cloning, um, VR experiences, and even the holograms, like the the ones that uh, toured with ABBA, which seemed like they were a little bit more sophisticated than the like projection on a piece of glass stuff of of yesteryear. I'm curious where you see these new technologies taking estates. How are estates using them? And do you see any sort of pitfalls or challenges um, that they need to keep in mind, um, or that fans need to be aware of as these technologies bring artists who have left us back into the room? They're returning to the building, so to speak. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Okay. Just uh, ruin my big title. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, let, 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 let's talk about ABBA first, and then we'll okay. talk about a, AI. ABBA to AI. That's a, a, a very short trip through the alphabet. Uh, <laughs> the ABBA thing is really interesting in that uh, if you look at the previous holograms, obviously they're around deceased artists. Mm-hmm. I think only in the case of Frank Zappa is there proper historic footage of him saying, I'd love to be a hologram, which is, that's why the Zappa, <laughs> Zappa I didn't know that. Was, that's incredible. He, that's very Zappa. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah and uh, he was fascinated by technology and mm-hmm. so forth. So the, the, the family kind of took that uh, uh, as a kind of uh, approval that he would have, they said he loved technology, he would have really enjoyed this, he would have he would have seen the kind of the arch postmodern potential mm-hmm. in it and uh, this kind of blurring of the lines between reality and unreality. And absolutely. Or in all the other instances, it's the estate making a decision on behalf of the dead artist saying, mm-hmm. okay, I, I think they would have been okay with that. And obviously it, it relies very much on family involvement. But also there's quite, sometimes there's public outcry. There was a, a proposed uh, Amy Winehouse one. And then yeah. the public outcry was such that they kind of mothballed it. It may come back, it may not, I don't know. Where ABBA is different is that all four members are still alive. Yes. I all, think in my enthusiasm, members. in my enthusiasm, I just declared. <laughs> I just yeah, put yeah, them no, in the no, same but, bucket but, but, as uh, the deceased, uh, and my apologies to the members of ABBA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I think in terms of what they've done with technology, because I've seen, I went to see the Buddy Holly Roy Orbison mm-hmm. uh, hologram tour, and I saw the Whitney Houston one, and they're calling the. It's basically they get actors who look very like the artist, and what they're doing is they're um, um, they've got a live band playing to a click track, and they're either using previous live recordings or uh, studio recordings of the of the singing. Mm-hmm. So it's not putting words in their mouths. With ABBA, they obviously were all involved. None of them want to tour. Uh, properly, and, yeah. Uh, but so they, but they did this. Uh, they obviously have signed off on this. They said mm-hmm. because that, well, they were involved. They did those search for the little bowls on them so they could do the um, track the movement, the mocap. And all of those yeah, things. I think I've seen some photos they, from that session. It's pretty pretty cute. Yeah, it's incredible. And there are bits where every one of them individually will speak to the audience. So they've obviously recorded stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's all completely signed off. It's all completely endorsed by them. Um, I think you will start to see other artists, uh, uh, either living artists or dad artists, look into this technology just simply because 
it's unlike any other live experience you've ever seen. It's phenomenal. But I think there are only a handful of acts that could really get away with that. If you're talking about the kind of acts that could do it, you're really talking who? You're probably talking the Beatles. You're mm-hmm. talking Queen, maybe Elton John. Uh, I guess in the modern era, a Beyonce or yeah. a Taylor Swift or something. You have I mean... to have this artist with decades of hits yeah and that also are still relevant and still appealing to new generations and there aren't that many of them so i'm surprised the stones haven't i'm surprised the stones haven't i'm surprised the rolling stones haven't done this because it seems like i mean maybe they just like touring ad infinitum but i i am absolutely sure that they will be looking at it because uh it, it was a line i used i stole it from someone it's a line i used uh in uh my EMI book talking about Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger's never seen a dollar note that he didn't like. So uh, if, if, <laughs> okay. if, 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 if it makes money, Mick's going to be interested. Um, it also, um, NAF, well, don't look it up because it's uh, an acronym that has uh, a rude word in it. Gotcha. In the, uh, the original definition. But NAF, to describe something as NAF is just something that is so utterly almost cripplingly uncool it, it, it you almost you almost want to collapse in tears at how awful it is yeah so the, the thing is that you can you can eradicate the madness by being directly involved in you can have creative Got input it. in that so i think you will see um i still think of it in, in this way you kind of you look at what abba have achieved with um uh, with uh, Abba Voyage and what you have to remember is this technology is incrementally getting better and better mm-hmm. and better. This is almost the equivalent of uh, at this stage in the technology, this is like the Lumiere brothers showing films of a train arriving in a station or, or working mm-hmm. leaving a factory, early, early cinema. Mm-hmm. We've still got synchronised sound, we've still got colour, we've still got all of these other massive leaps technology-wise. So this is even though it's phenomenal, but you know it's going to get even, even better. So I think lots and lots of artists will be looking at that. The other point you raised is voice cloning. AI. Yeah, let's talk about that. That's now ubiquitous and it's way cheaper and easier to execute than any hologram type setup. Absolutely. And I think the, the, the issue that is missing here is, uh, is consent. Mm-hmm. And, uh, because the artist... Uh, or their family are not necessarily in control of what happens with AI. But also, even as, as I mentioned with the, the the hologram tours, that this was based on studio recordings or live recordings. Obviously, the ABBA staff, they are, are all completely signed off on it, were, were heavily involved all the way through. They weren't involved in a uh, design and a perfume thing, which is basically just take the check at the end of the day. They were they were mm-hmm. creatively involved all mm-hmm. the way through. With AI, this is you're at the point now where things can be said that the artist never said. Mm-hmm. So at the extreme end, you could have someone saying, uh, I love the NRA and everyone should have guns in schools. It's brilliant. And they were never, they, they, can, yes. they can say things that politically they completely disagree with. Or yeah. I endorse, let's not mention his name, but I endorse that man <laughs> running for president again. And they were, yeah. and they were, and they were a lifeline, lifetime Democrat, for example. Yeah. Or you could, or you could, or you could say, uh, have the artist on stage go in, thank you very much, uh, New York, and please go to McDonald's and buy uh, a Big Mac after yes. and get a $1 discount. Or, or they could just, it, it becomes crusty the decline at that point with the, mm-hmm. well, I hereby endorse this service and our product. Um, and that's, that's where like, already it's kind of ethically complex and morally mm-hmm. complex, but, but that's only based on what existed you're only recreating what existed in the past in a different medium that's all hologram tours are at the minute mm-hmm. so like you can cut all the moral ethical debates that's really all it is it's basically just representing the an artist in a different medium this is in, in the form of a hologram in inverted commas with ai uh all better off 
And yeah. I think that that's where everyone has to be incredibly careful because, uh, as we can see, as I as I talked about that Lumiere Brothers parallel, what we're getting now with uh, voice uh, deepfake technology and uh, everything else, and you you see, YouTube's flooded with the what if Johnny Cash recorded Nevermind? What would it mm-hmm. sound like? And generally, it's terrible. But you're going to get stuff that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, I, I, the way that they that iterative uh, AI and the way that they can train it on, I think I read somewhere that you really only need like a minute or two of someone talking to be able to have them to go through enough syllables and make enough sounds for you to start to replicate their voice completely. And that- for singing, to have a really good voice model, it's I, I've, what I've heard from people building them right now is about 30 to 45 minutes of excellent recordings, like of, of actual per- singing performance. But that's not very much. That's a handful, right? Well, that, that's half an album. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, yeah, so all of that stuff is out there. And all of that stuff is anything can be done with it so Mm -hmm. i think it's the idea of kind of oh let's imagine what they would uh, if they wrote a new song today or if they covered uh a hit of today what would it sound like um as a as a technological exercise it's interesting as an artistic exercise it's tedious and pointless but <laughs> never underestimate people's desire at least once to listen to something awful mm-hmm. uh, so if you if you get 25 million people listening to something awful once that's a, a decent trickle of royalties coming yeah. in but i think it, it's much more when it's the spoken word stuff so it's when they start to say political things mm. or they get involved in in culture war debates or things like that. And um, can you cancel a, an AI creation? I don't know. Can you? Maybe. Well, and um, and that would be something uh, 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 in a state would feel pretty terrified about because that's as you mentioned with the Priscilla Presley absolutely. example. It's all about the image and the sort of worship yeah. of this past person's you know legacy vibe persona. You could destroy that really fast with the right AI. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know if uh, obviously name, image, and likeness are protected under law, but. I would need to speak to uh, an IP lawyer about can you copyright your speaking voice? I don't know. Can you? Yeah, it's because... it's definitely an open field right now, and and the yeah, and, precedents and, and that, aren't that, in yet. Yeah, yeah, the openness of it kind of terrifies me because uh, never underestimate people's willingness to push things to the worst degree. So someone yeah. somewhere will do something absolutely awful and. Um, Again, that word naff. Uh, so basically, all the states need to avoid being naff because naff is the is the uh, uh, fastest route to kind of ruining uh, a legacy. But I think uh, AI is that turbocharged. I think that could do indescribable damage. I think you've you've obviously had uh, there's a new a new Beatles track uh, mm-hmm. coming out later this year and. Everyone was really upset because Paul McCartney said there was AI involved. And, oh my God! And he basically said, "Well, actually, we're just using AI to clean up the uh, the tape that John Lennon's vocals were on." Mm-hmm. And it's kind of the same technology that they used in uh, the brilliant Get Back uh, documentary that Peter Jackson's mm-hmm. been developed to separate out the audio. And I think that's really interesting because is that any different from garage band or any studio technique or jumping from eight track to four track? It's yeah. just a continuation of that because it's not uh, it's not recreating something. It's just making what was already recorded uh, clearer. That's all it is. It's basically just picking a blurred picture and then just adjusting the lens so that it comes into uh, sharper focus. So I think things like that are absolutely fine. And you, you find that a lot where I, I, I talked about it in the book. I talked about the uh, guy who uh, was Elliot Smith's producer mm-hmm. and being able to uh, studio software had got to the point where they could clean up all like 
his his high school band where it was stuff recorded on a crackly cassette and they could start to clean it up. It said that we're not having anything. All we're doing is just getting rid of that hate, the tape haze and things mm-hmm. like that to, to make it listenable. That 30 years ago was impossible. It's possible now, but it's but it's not uh, it's not manipulating the original recording in any way. But AI is entirely about manipulating original recordings to create something new, and that that is a very very ideologically unsigned route that could be gone down. So I I think estates will be need to be very, very careful about how closely they flirt with this technology. Got it. Well, this has been a somewhat, and we ended on a good scary note, I think, which is very appropriate for Halloween. Um, but this has been a really fascinating overview and, and, and a tour of how estates work and why they matter. Um, thanks so much, Eamon, for your incredible insight and historical knowledge. And um, it's been a really fun conversation. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We have new episodes for you every week. Did you know we do free monthly online events that you, our lovely podcast listeners, can join? Find out more at musictectonics.com. And while you're there, look for the latest about our annual conference and sign up for our newsletter to get updates. Everything we do explores the seismic shifts that shake up music and technology, the way the Earth's tectonic plates cause quakes and make mountains. Connect with Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. That's my favorite platform. Connect with me, Dimitri Vitsa, if you can spell it. We'll be back again next week, if not sooner. You're listening to Music Tectonics.